just just hearing Warren's prayer reminded me, yes, it is about hypocrisy. I hope you weren't sitting there thinking the perfect teacher uh, to teach us about it. But uh, so uh, we've got Dan beginning a series in Ephesians uh, today. He just finished the, the Gospel of John. That's what I call a one-two punch uh, right there. Looking forward to to that for sure. One of the great, great epistles in the Bible, the epistle to the Ephesians. Um, should be one of my favorite mornings of the year after uh, gaining an hour of sleep. I rolled over and looked at the clock. It said 6.30. I thought, oh no, it's not 6.30, it's 5.30. And so I got up, that's perfect. And uh, a bit later in the morning, well, when I went out in the front, the sun was further up than I thought. And later I looked at this watch and it was 740 or something like that. So I feel like I didn't get the full advantage <laughs> of daylight savings time, but ending. Luke 11, please. <clears throat> the further one reads in the gospels, you know, uh, the more you find Jesus' fame spreading. As we come to the last verses of this 11th chapter, he has increasingly gained notoriety, traveling throughout Galilee and engaging uh, in, with ever larger crowds of people, leaving in his wake uh, all sorts of reactions to his presence, his miracles, and the uh, content of his teaching. Above all, he was arousing uh, the animus of those who would be his enemies. And now as we come to verse 37, an opportunity arises to retreat from these uh, multitudes and meet with a small group of these enemies. Uh, so we'll read verse 37 to the end of the chapter. We're in Luke 11. Now when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him, and he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed uh, before the meal. But the Lord said to him, uh, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you you are full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs. You see in the margin, indistinct tombs. You can't tell they're there. And the people who walk over these tombs are unaware of it. One of the lawyers said to him in reply, you may read in the margin, they were experts in the Mosaic law. These terms were used interchangeably sometimes between lawyers, namakas, and scribes, grammates, people of letters. I'm not certain how distinct the lawyers and the scribes were. You got the Pharisees, and we'll say more about that in a minute. But one of the lawyers uh, said to him in reply, Teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. But he said, Woe to you lawyers as well, for you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you, your, while you yourselves will not even touch the uh, burdens with one of your fingers. 
so I'm not reading this. <laughs> I should have brought my glasses, but I'm, hang in there with me. <laughs> I've been studying it, so that helps. Uh, woe to you, verse 47 of Luke 11. Uh, woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. So you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason also, the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God, yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. Uh, you yourselves did not enter, and you hindered those who were entering. When he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees uh, began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. Pharisees and, and scribes. Uh, their names are etched into our New Testament mental storybook as emblems for the enemies of Christ. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Jesus was not reluctant to make that pointed criticism of them on several occasions, and all three synoptic gospels record them. The Pharisees emerged out of the, it is hot in here, I would love for it to be cooler, somebody. The Pharisees emerged out of the post-exilic uh, period as a strict religious party devoted to the Torah with an almost uh, fanatical determination to keep that law and thus distinguish themselves from all the other peoples, including fellow Jews who followed the law less closely. The name Pharisee means separatist. Their party included many of the scribes as well, also mentioned prominently in our passage, though not all the Pharisees were scribes. And you'll notice in our passage today, I mentioned it at, during the reading, that they are identified uh, both as lawyers and as scribes. Uh, they were experts in the study of the law. And so intellectually and socially, they were considered more of the professional class, while the Pharisees were classified uh, as what we would call today uh, religious practitioners. The Pharisees were indeed religious people. We know people like them uh, today. Uh, and as we observe them in our New Testaments, we recognize the type of religion that is focused on the external and on appearances while neglecting the inward virtues of true devotion to God. Nothing perhaps illustrated that more than the Pharisees' ceremonial rituals about the washing of hands uh, before eating anything, or for that matter, after having come into contact with any non-Jew uh, outside their own people, outside their own race, they would engage in uh, the kind of hand-washing ritual we just encountered in the opening verses of our reading. Uh, the instructions for which these, these hand-washings were outlined in precise uh, detail in the Mishnah, uh, leaving nothing to chance. The Mishnah was that collection of writings by the rabbis that attempted to uh, be a commentary, basically, on uh, the law. Very uh, uh, exhaustive uh, uh, details in the Mishnah. A Pharisee, uh, perhaps a prominent one, uh, had invited Jesus to come into his home and have lunch with him. Uh, we learned eventually that there were others invited as well, uh, likely scribes and Pharisees themselves, 
And the invitation almost certainly was meant as an occasion to put Jesus under scrutiny or even to test him so that Jesus, we will recall, was an, an outsider to them. So that would have been what they wanted to do. If his hospitality uh, was a test, uh, the Lord was kind enough to underhand a soft toss to him, ignoring the hand-washing requirement altogether. Uh, and the Pharisee was surprised, uh, Luke writes. Uh, likely he was also indignant, uh, for he was unaccustomed to having an invited guest decline to abide by the well-known accepted uh, rules for the washing of hands. Though it's not stated explicitly, he must have voiced his objection, and Jesus was ready with something of an in-your-face response. I would describe it as a harsh uh, response, but only if we understand it as totally justified. If you've been reading through the Old Testament prophetic books like I have, uh, this tone sounds familiar to us, delivered with the voice of God. He said to the Pharisee, now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you, you're full of robbery and, and wickedness. Uh, you foolish ones, you fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? Uh, but give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. And so his meaning is uh, immediately clear. He was assailing them for their focus on the outward appearance while ignoring what is inside. Uh, typically, for Jesus, he uses for an illustration uh, tangible items that were present in front of them. The table was likely filled uh, with cups and, and platters. Uh, who would want to drink, uh, especially someone I know well, who would want to drink from a cup that has been wiped clean on the outside, but it, it remains filthy on uh, the inside. Well, that was what metaphorically characterized the Pharisees. They had the externals down pat, but all their minute rules and regulations and restrictions pertaining to the visible displays of their religion had become unhinged from the spiritual reality that animated God's law itself. This was not a new thing for the Jewish clerical class. For centuries, Israel had been uh, guilty of much the same, and God saw through their bare routines and formalism. The first uh, chapter of Isaiah finds the Lord castigating them. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. He goes on like that for a while in Isaiah chapter 1. But then he gets to the bigger point. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Def defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Likewise, Micah uh, prophesied in his sixth chapter, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. The Pharisees now, among whom Jesus walked, were concerned with what a person does. Well, Jesus was concerned with that too, uh, but more so with who a person is on the inside. On the inside, sadly, they were full of robbery and wickedness. Now, how was that? How were they full of robbery? How were they full of, of wickedness? It was in that they routinely focused on appearances and the legalistic strictures they attempted to enforce on the people while completely neglecting the very real material needs of the poor and the helpless among them. And now uh, God knows. 
and they're fools uh, for not realizing that. You foolish ones, he says, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? And the preferred attitude and response he gives in verse 41, but give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. It may, the meaning of that may not immediately be clear, but it can be interpreted in several ways. But what Jesus seems to have been indicating was that the Pharisees should exchange their formulaic and sparse almsgiving that had characterized them for one more fundamental and pleasing to uh, God. Give away, in other words, their robbery and wickedness. And that will prove to be the most cleansing thing of all. Only from a pure heart can a person do anything pleasing to God. Only from a pure heart. All your righteous acts are filthy rags, Isaiah says. Well, it's easy to sit here in our comfortable church environment, uh, 20 centuries removed from the world of the Pharisees and look down upon them, but their failures can easily become ours as well. Our uh, attendance can become rote. Our Bible reading, for that matter, can become rote. And we run the risk of substituting uh, an edifice of so-called Christianity that looks decent on the outside but is devoid of inner reality. Inside, we are guilty of neglect and the accumulation of uncleansed greed, insensitive, insensitivity to the needs of others, and general love for worldly things leaves no room for the attitude that God implores that we adopt. In short, we risk succumbing to the sins that characterize strict religious persons or what one commentator derisively called churchmen. We risk that. Put them all aside, Paul wrote to uh, the Colossians in Colossians 3. All those sinful attitudes and, and pretensions and, and put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you instead. The important thing is what is uh, within, not the facade that we erect to impress others and deceive ourselves. God knows and God sees, to borrow from Mike's lesson uh, last week, he sees uh, what is in our heart and largely ignores our pretensions or worse, pays great attention to them. He opposes hypocrisy. But his Pharisee host opening salvo about hand washing had the effect of setting the Lord off, if I can put it that way. Because beginning in verse 42, he mournfully begins to pronounce his noted woes against the Pharisees. Woe to you Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting uh, the others. And we've seen these woes uh, before and talked about uh, them. Uh, but I want to repeat an observation I made. Uh, much like the Lord's blesseds, uh, which he uses, for example, in the Beatitudes, they're more, uh, the, these woes are more of an observation about the object of the blessing or the woe. His woes are an expression of his regret over their condition rather than a kind of hostile uh, denunciation of them. So the first woe uh, expresses Jesus is grieving over the Pharisees' uh, tithing practices. The, the tithe was for an Israelite an obligation uh, from the law. They were to return one-tenth of their income or their produce uh, to the Lord on an ongoing uh, basis with the promise that the Lord's bounty would never fail. That's 
side note, that remains true today. It's not a tie that's a grateful and voluntary, even spontaneous giving, but we are to give, we're to give sacrificially, and God promises he will return uh, the bounty back to us. So the Pharisees tithed and attached inordinate importance to it to the degree that they went far beyond what was required. The, the law required, to use this example, uh, the tithing of agricultural produce. Uh, but nothing was said in the law about the type of small garden herbs mentioned here, mint and rue, and we suppose a cilantro and basil and the like. But by their obsession over such trivial objects, the Pharisees had made a, a mockery out of what was and should have been a, a good thing. When people concentrate on the, the trivial, they are at risk of overlooking the more important things. The Lord's disapproval was not that they tithed, but that they transformed it into something prideful. And worse than that, uh, neglected the most important things. In this case, justice for others and overall love for God. It was an age-old failure. In Mark chapter 7, <clears throat> during a scene similar to this one, the Lord calls them hypocrites. And then he quotes Isaiah 29, 13. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they... Uh, worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. And so this was the failure of uh, the Pharisees. If their focus had been on the things important to God, they still would have had the capacity uh, for tithing. Uh, they were guilty of imbalance. The second woe comes to us in verse 43. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. This was a denunciation of the pride that had overcome them due to their positions and, and roles in their communities, and as we see in their gathering uh, for worship. Leon Morris, uh, whose commentary we study and quote from frequently, Morris has pointed out that the seats in the front of the synagogues were the most favored, uh, the ones that faced out to uh, the congregation, and so they were considered to be uh, the most desired of the seats. They were reserved, surprise, surprise, for the men of position who uh, then could be assured that no one could miss the status to which they had attained. It, it gave them an opportunity for their attainment to be seen. And there's that word seen again. We see this theme. Uh, rather than concern that God and his glory might be made manifest in their meetings, they saw them as opportunities for their high status to be put on uh, display. The clerical class had also created a misguided culture in which it was expected that certain uh, members were do special greetings when they were out and about with the people in, in the marketplace. In Matthew's account, the Lord goes on to criticize the Pharisees for seeking respectful titles. You remember this, like rabbi or father or leader. A different state of affairs ought to exist among those for whom they more correctly only had one rabbi or leader and certainly only one uh, father but these men had fallen in love, so to speak, with that kind of prideful recognition, so much so that it had replaced real faith in the God they claimed so pridefully to serve. How can you believe, Jesus demanded of them in John chapter 5, verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? It was a sad thing that they had been so thoroughly overcome with pride, and so the Lord was dismayed by it. Pride is a sad thing. And sadder still is uh, the ease with which we fall a prey to it. 
It manifests itself in so many ways, from the insufferable, vacuous, preening, poser. I had another word, but I chose that instead. Vacuous, preening, poser, who is more comical than dangerous, to the sad you, who leaving a social gathering, despairs when you realize that you spent the whole time talking about yourself. Has that ever happened to you? I can't resist telling the story again of the older church woman who rushed up to the visiting preacher after the sermon to enthusiastically and breathlessly inform him, Pastor, I have not sinned for 40 years. <laughs> to which he responded, you must be very proud. She said, oh, I am. <laughs> there went 40 years. Well, all these failures of the Pharisees had a baneful effect on others. Uh, that's the nature of the sins of leaders. Their, their consequences are not confined to the perpetrators. And that's the illusion we're defined in verse 44, where Jesus likens them to concealed graves. Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. For a faithful Jew to come into contact with a grave was to incur ceremonial uh, defilement. And consequently, the Jews were meticulous to make sure that tombs were clearly identifiable. And that was why, according to custom, on the eve of the annual festivals held in Jerusalem, when thousands and thousands of pilgrims would be making their way into the city, graves would be whitewashed in order to make it easier to avoid them. And now Jesus compares the Pharisees themselves to tombs that are not distinguishable. They had not been clearly marked so that the people could walk over them without knowing that they were being uh, defiled. So the application is obvious. It was bad enough that by their empty religion and sinful behavior, the Pharisees were leading the people into defilement, but worse, they habitually concealed their true nature. Interestingly, and perhaps some of you are thinking of this, on other occasions, the Lord used the figure of a whitewashed tomb from the opposite angle in order to make a similar uh, point. In Matthew 23, 27, uh, Jesus pronounces his woe upon the scribes and Pharisees because they are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside, they are full of dead men's bones and, and all uncleanness. It was a different kind of concealment, but the effect was the same. They were concealing their true nature and thus leaving in their wake a trail of unsuspecting, spiritually defiled followers. But the same, in the same way, all of us, though we may like to project an exterior facade of spiritual uprightness, if the re reality is rather artificiality, affectedness, and hidden pride, it will inevitably become apparent and others may suffer for our corrupting duplicity. This is, this is a failure that's common to Christians, uh, to appear as one thing on the outside but be entirely different on the inside. And we have to guard against that constantly. We have to spend time in prayer and in, in the study of the word and in the fellowship of the saints and in order in, in confession with uh, the Lord God. Lord, make me pure on the inside and not just holy on the outside. Well, at that, one of the lawyers dining there began to take umbrage. He was one of the scribes mentioned earlier as experts in the study of the law and possibly also a Pharisee. He said, teacher, when you speak like this, you insult us too. And Jesus responds in a similar way, again, pronouncing three woes. The first is in verse 
uh, 46, and it speaks to the absurdity of their very profession. By definition, uh, the scribes were experts at parsing the different stipulations and obligations contained in the Mosaic Law. They had erected uh, complex interpretations of the law that served as a hedge. You've heard this word used before about uh, the Pharisees and the scribes. They, they served as a hedge around the various commandments meant to ensure that they were not uh, violated. But the result was a, a Sears catalog of, of narrow and detailed prescriptions that became extremely burdensome for the people to navigate, for the people to follow. We, we know some of them quite well from our readings in the Gospels. Uh, rules regarding the Sabbaths, uh, prohibit, pro, prohibition against labor, for example, were prolific. Uh, Kent Hughes noted that to ensure that no work was performed on the Sabbath, the Mishnah listed 39 classifications of labor with each category cap capable of endless subdivision. Remember the disciples, we remember them, uh, for example, uh, walking through the grain fields and they were hungry and it was the Sabbath. So they were picking some of the heads of the grain and rubbing them in their hands and eating them. And some Pharisees saw them and demanded, uh, what, do you, what you do is, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Uh, the Pharisees found in the plucking of the ears of grain a breach of the regulation that forbade uh, reaping and in the rubbing in their hands that which prohibited threshing, uh, throwing away the husk probably represented winnowing and eating showed that they had prepared a meal. As one of the commentators comically noted, four distinct breaches of the Sabbath in one mouthful. <laughs> The Pharisees insisted they were working on the Sabbath. And of course, there were Jesus's uh, many miracles of healing on the Sabbath, including the lame man in John chapter five, who obeyed Jesus's command after he healed him and picked up his pallet and began to walk. And John comments in the same breath, now it was on the Sabbath on that, it was the Sabbath on that day and the Jews immediately protested, it's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. So that kind of thing uh, was one side of it, the burdening, but the other Jesus accuses is you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. It's a bit of a mystery what he meant by that. It can be interpreted in one of two ways, either that while they were good at burdening others, they themselves wouldn't lift a finger uh, to help them with the burdens that they had created, or that they had conjured up ways for themselves to avoid the obligations and therefore didn't find it necessary to even touch one of them with their finger. That, that is the same ones who conjured up the burdens also knew the clever loopholes that relieved them from the same. Either way, it was an abuse of true faith, a sacrilege against God's holy word, and another example of hypocrisy. But Jesus had a second and third woe for the lawyers, just as he had for the Pharisees. The second is found in verses 47 through 51. His accusation is that they build new tombs for the prophets of old while it was their fathers who had actually killed them. Apparently it was common at this time for the Jewish leaders to erect new tombs to replace old ones. But Jesus charges that in actuality they were unconsciously witnessing to and approving what their fathers had done in persecuting God's prophets. Now he explains it, get the flow of this, he explains it in verses 49 through 51. It was actually God's wisdom that moved him to send the prophets of old. They could be called apostles, he calls them apostles also. They could be called that in the sense that they were officially sent and commissioned by God to be his messengers but it was actually his wisdom that moved him to send them, knowing all along 
that his disobedient and rebellious people would kill some and persecute others. Throughout the Old Testament, we see that pattern uh, persist uh, uh, throughout and be repeated over and over again. In Jesus' generation, so we're back at the present time, the leaders claim that if they had been living in the time of their fathers, they would have been partnered, they would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Now you can see them saying that in Matthew, Matthew chapter 3, verse 29 and following. But at that moment, uh, just as in the days of old, so they, they were saying, if we'd been back, if we'd been alive back then, we wouldn't have done that. We're different uh, than our fathers who killed uh, the prophets. But at that moment, just as in those days, uh, their rhetoric and their professed piety masked what was the reality in their hearts. Even then, they were, be they were plotting behind closed doors to kill the greatest prophet God had ever sent. Well, shockingly, I think, he, he goes on to suggest that even all that ancient history was designed by God himself to bring about the guilt of his enemies in this generation. That's what he says, the blood of all the prophets, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God, all of those heinous crimes of rebellion would be charged against them. Abel was the first of God's prophets uh, murdered. Zechariah was stoned to death in the very, quote, court of the house of the Lord as recorded in 2 Chronicles 24. 2 Chronicles was the last uh, book in the Hebrew uh, text. Uh, so he, from the first to the last, in other words, and instead of heeding God's word to them through the prophets, uh, they disobeyed it, killed the prophets, and worse, kept God's people from exposure to his word. And that is the meaning of the third woe, uh, pronounced in verse 52. They had taken away the key of knowledge, which is the word of God. They had taken it away, refusing to enter into its riches themselves and then hindering others who might have benefited from God's blessings found in his word. Instead of opening up for them these treasures of knowledge and grace, the lawyers so obscured the message of the word with inscrutable tradition and onerous and ridiculous demands, they left the common man bereft of their benefit and lost in the darkness of their religion. They were Christ's enemies supposed to be shepherds, they instead had become wolves. And for that, they drew the good shepherd's scorn and rebuke. They, they reeked of hypocrisy. Well, the final verses of the chapter summarize the growing hostility between the scribes and the Pharisees and the one against whom they were plotting, hoping to find something, as Luke says, for which they could convict him and at the same time escape culpability for their own sin. And such are the methods of man-made religion detached from the inward reality of faith. How sad, how incredibly sad. Our world is full of despair, filled with desperate people who are seeking meaning for their life and hope for an uncertain future. And too often, the visible church is not an aid to them, but a hindrance, a burying the treasure of the great truths of grace and forgiveness and salvation found in the Word of God and substituting in their place the vanities of earthly good works that are supposed to merit God's love and mercy. But that's false religion, sadly found on street corners across America in the Western world at large. Cindy and I attended 
Friday, the memorial service for our daughter-in-law's uh, mom. It was inspiring and it was in so encouraging because the word was not hidden and the fruit of it was greatly reported in the life of her mom. We have become friends over the years with her. She had suffered a deadly disease for almost 15 years and as she saw death uh, approaching these last weeks and months, she repeated uh, often the sweet testimony of true believers. I know where I'm going and I'm not afraid to go there. The last visit we had with her when she was still conscious, she told us she was headed for that narrow gate. That's what she said. <laughs> That's the blessing. That is the blessing that the false teachers keep from needy, hurting people, the hope of Christ. That's what we have. We have it in large, because God is gracious to us, we have it in uh, through his instruments, through this church. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, thanks, thank the Lord for Believer's Chapel. Lord, keep us from this kind of hypocrisy. We're all prone to it ourselves. Uh, we're, pro we're prone to pride. Uh, we're prone to preening. Um, we confess that, and we know it's a sin, but Lord, May you fill us uh, with the deep and true faith and hope and testimony that can only come from the Holy Spirit's uh, work in our lives. How grateful we are for forgiveness in Christ, for salvation in him, for this church and the people that are here and have that true faith and bear witness to it by their lives. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.